Hi, and welcome. My name is Sandy Carter, and I'm Amazon Web Services Vice President for Public Sector Partners and Programs. And I am so excited to be here with you, even though it's virtual, at the Digital Asia Summit 2021. We are going to spend a few minutes together really exploring innovation in a digital world. Now, I've been to Asia so many times, I can't even count anymore, whether it was to uh, Singapore, Vietnam, Australia, China, Japan, um, Taiwan, you name it. I think I've been there and I've fallen in love with everything about Asia. So it's such a pleasure today to share my thoughts to the team that is driving Digital Asia Summit 2021. So let's go ahead and get started talking about innovation. And what I'd really like to do is begin with a story. So I have two daughters, and one of the things that I really love about my daughters is we have all these great traditions. And one of the traditions is that we make pancakes every Sunday morning. So one Sunday, my two daughters came to me and they said, Mom, could you make us this pancake? And of course, I looked at it and I said, of course, I can make that pancake. And so I did. You're probably laughing right now because of the way my pancake turned out, but it's a great uh, experiment or lesson in digital innovation. First, I did listen to my customers who were my daughters and they were ecstatic with the pancake. They took pictures and much to my chagrin, posted it up on Instagram. Secondly, as any MVP or minimal viable product, this particular product was usable, although it lacked something in the UI and the user interface, but my daughters did eat it and very much enjoyed it. And then the third and final lesson is that, you know, as you innovate, you experiment and you get better and better and better as you go along. So that my final try at this pancake was very close to the one on the left-hand side. So innovation can occur anywhere in a business today. Most people, though, only think about innovation in terms of a product. And while product innovation is a great way to innovate, there are other types of innovation that we see all over the world that are also equally important. Think about operational excellence innovation, such as robotics, potentially helping out in a manufacturing facility or experimentation and innovation around the client experience. In fact, Gartner says that the client experience is one of the last forms of true competitive advantage. Think about client experience, like how you might buy something from Amazon and how Amazon innovated in that client experience, innovating to where you could buy books digitally. And then there, of course, there's the business model. And I think the business model is one that's used a lot in Silicon Valley, uh, where I was raised on technology. Uh, if you think about it, Airbnb, who is an AWS client, innovated their business model. Think about, you know, being able to rent a, a room or a house, but they don't own any inventory. Complete change in the hospitality industry and how innovation is done. So as you're thinking about innovation today across the board, whether you're in marketing or product management or in engineering, think about how you might innovate in that product, but don't forget to also think about innovation and operational excellence around the client experience and what you can do as well in that business model too. Now, for me, innovation is really about empathy, empathy for your customer, really putting yourself in their shoes so that you understand their problems and that you can solve them. This is one reason why Amazon Web Services hires builders, because we sell to builders. And what better way to have empathy for the challenges that exist than to be one of what your customer is today as well. So there are three C's that I wanted to talk to you about in our brief time together today that I think really are crucial as you're looking at building an innovation engine at your company. One is customer obsession. The second is culture. And the third is curiosity. So three C's that we'll talk about today. Let's start first with that customer obsession. And I do mean customer obsession. And you're probably thinking, doesn't? everyone do this today? Isn't everyone customer focused or customer driven? 
I would say no. I've worked for many different companies who said they were customer focused or customer driven, but what they meant was the sales team talked to the customers, not every engineer, not their executive team. Um, it meant that sometimes they focused on the technology, not the customer, and then fit the customer in where needed. Um, and it really didn't mean they were obsessed. Yes, it meant they focused on it or they looked at it, but it's really about true customer obsession that gets you to innovation, that enables you to look around corners and to be able to innovate before maybe a customer even knows what they want. So let me share with you a couple of examples. So this is actually a startup out of Silicon Valley. They developed a salt shaker where you put salt out that was extremely interesting. Now these salt shakers actually have IOT sensors in them. So when you pick a salt shaker up, it knows that you're picking it up. It also uses artificial intelligence. It remembers when you use salt the last time and how much you use so that you could potentially replicate your last salt dosage. But wait, there's even more. There's a mobile device. So you could go on your mobile device and then trigger the salt shaker to understand that the salt, you're getting ready to pick it up and you're getting ready to pour out the right amount of salt. And it connected with Alexa and had music that was able to come out of the salt shaker with lights. Now, of course, you're probably sitting there thinking, who needs this? Now, is this customer driven or is this technology driven? I would argue that this is very much technology driven. This company used every buzzword, mobile, artificial intelligence, IoT, um, even connecting in with Alexa. But in the end, was it customer driven? Like what customer wants to physically pick up salt and have music and lights flashing or remember how much or take even the time to go to a mobile app for the simple act of pouring salt. This is not an example of customer obsession. Now, let me give you another example that I do think it's a non-technology example, but I do think it's a great example of customer obsession. And this is a company called True Jerky. Now, jerky is a little strips of meat that you eat and this company supposedly has the best jerky of anyone. In fact, people would come and get this jerky and order multiple bags. So when the product management team started asking customers, what don't you like about the jerky? They said, well, it gets stuck in our teeth. And so the product team, as most teams do, when they started looking at innovating on the product side. What could they do from the product to change the product so the product was ready to go? And so they changed the, the formula so it wouldn't stick in your teeth, but people didn't like the taste as much. Well, then they started thinking, well, we can innovate in other things like the customer experience. And so if you look here in that black circle there, it says dental floss inside. Now this was truly innovation in the customer experience because now they didn't change the product. They innovated on how the customer experienced the product afterwards, getting the, the dental floss and getting the, the, the meat stuck out of their teeth. I love this example because it is non-technology, but it really illustrates customer obsession and looking at innovation in different ways. And so if you compare those two examples, um, there are a couple of lessons that we use at Amazon when innovating. The first one is always work backwards from the customer. Don't work backwards from the technology, work backwards from the customer. I know when I first innovated my first service at Amazon Web Services, I personally talked to 141 partners and customers myself. And that did include my team and who they talked to. We obsess over the customer. We really wanna understand what the core problems are so that we can really innovate on those. Secondly, one of the things that we do is we write a press release before we write a single line of code. This is exactly opposite of every other company who writes the press release after whatever they've innovated is created. We write it ahead of time to use it as our guiding light, our guiding principle. It really enables us as well to net out what we're trying to do so that we're not trying to boil the ocean. 
because the press release has to be one page and really crisp. It has to have real customer quotes in it. So you have to have already talked to your customers and it really enables you to frame what the problem is, what the value proposition is and why your customers really love what you will be announcing. The third thing that we do to innovate is we write an FAQ or set of frequently asked questions. When I first had to ask, write my frequently asked questions, I thought this will be easy because I'll post my own questions, but wouldn't you know it, Amazon has their own. So there are questions like, oh, you're having dinner with a customer and they're raving about your new product, your new business model, your new customer experience. What are they saying? And then the flip side, you're having drinks with that with another customer and they're telling you they hate something about that product. What would that be? What would they be most disappointed in? And several times we would actually start all over again if the disappointment from the customer would be too great or too big um, that we would say, you know what? We definitely want to change that out. So the types of questions that we think about as we're working backwards from the customer are some that seem basic, like who is the customer? Well, I'm not talking about an industry. I'm talking about the actual person, like who is actually your customer? Is it a marketing director? Is it an IT manager? Is it a CISO? Who specific are you designing this for? And then we ask, what is the customer problem that we're trying to solve? And we try to be very specific. We're not trying to solve world peace. We're trying to fix a particular problem. And then we ask what the most important customer benefit is. So not every benefit, but the most important one. That enables us, once we start writing code, to focus in and hone in on that one, to optimize on that one. And then we always ask a very tough question. How do you know what the customer really needed? Sometimes you're biased you have an unconscious bias and it's unconscious, so you don't know it. So we always ask, how did you know this is what the customer needed? Did you actually talk to them? Did you have a diverse team talking to them? What did the, you know, what did they, what did they actually say? And then finally, one of the most important questions, what does a customer experience look like? I will tell you on my first innovative uh, service, our CEO, Andy Jassy, actually looked at my wireframes, um, which is pretty, fascinating to me that a CEO would look at it, but that just shows you how important that customer experience is at every level inside of Amazon. One of the ways that I discover the answer to these questions is I'm out talking to partners and customers all the time. I, um, since we've had COVID and I know you have too, we couldn't get out there and visit like today we're virtual. And so I decided if I couldn't go directly to talk to my customers and visit them in their local culture, I would go visit them virtually. So I kicked off 100 partners in 100 days. And I included partners in every part of the world and worked on their time zone as well. So I talked to, to uh, partners and customers in um, Asia Pac, um, Singapore, Vietnam, uh, Australia, China, Taiwan you name it, I talk to customers everywhere, as well as Europe and Latin America, Canada and the United States. And I learned so much about my partners by doing that. One of the interesting things I did learn is that our partners are doing so many things that I call hashtag tech for good. So for example, we had a, a partner out in Australia and they've developed an AIML solution to help track and identify bushfire assessments. How cool is that? We had Cloudicity who looked at um, ensuring that their healthcare solutions followed certain compliance statutes. And even SAP NS2 looking at how they were helping and how they were assisting as well um, in some of the military efforts. So lessons can be learned from everywhere. You've got to get out there and you got to talk to your customers before you can truly innovate around a solution. So now my second C is around culture. And I love culture. One of my favorite quotes here is, culture eats strategy for lunch or breakfast or dinner. Culture is um, so critically important. If you're really obsessed about the customer, but you don't have the right culture, you still won't get that great innovative spirit on your teams. 
So I'm a Carnegie Mellon Silicon Valley um, adjunct professor. And one of my students raised his hand and asked, hey, what is culture? I thought it was a great question. Culture is the way you do things. It's not how you talk about doing things. It's actually the way that you do things. Um, for those geeks like me, it's the software of the mind. And really it reflects what's so important about who you are as a business, your values, that's important enough to pass on to the next generation. So for example, right now you can't see it, but my desk is actually a door. A door you say? Yeah, I know, I was confused too. But the lesson that was passed down in Amazon was Jeff Bezos started the company in a garage. He didn't wanna spend money on a desk, so he took a door and built his desk around the door being very frugal to spend money on the right things. Well, that's a cultural lesson for Amazonians. It, it's a lesson that's passed down and shown, experienced by what we do, not what we say that we do. Another example is, you know, failure is not an option or in Amazon, failure is the best way to learn. And I learned that over and over again. In fact, one of my first meetings one of my first business reviews, I was asked to start and explain all the things that I had done wrong and what I had learned. And people celebrated where I had failed and learned almost more so than where I had been really successful. Really interesting. Great way to think about culture. Now, culture, you know, being customer obsessed, this is one of our partners, which is Splunk. Um, and this is a university in the United States. It's called University of Illinois. And uh, during COVID, they wanted to make sure that as students were coming back into university, that everyone was safe. And so they wanted to do a COVID test. They wanted to check vaccines. And so working backwards from the customer, not the technology, they found out that, you know, they needed something fast and easy. So they decided to almost rep uh, recreate or replicate what an airline does. They give you a boarding pass and the boarding pass gives you entry onto the airplane. So what they created on their phone were these boarding passes that showed you'd had your COVID test and that it was negative, or you had your vaccine report and that you could get in. It was very much of a customer obsessed solution that then used technology to create it versus being a solution that started with the technology and then worked backwards to fit the customer in. I love this example. I think it's so powerful. Now, another core element of culture is your teams. And one of the elements of a team is the size of your team. And uh, I was actually in a startup before I came to Amazon. People would always ask me, wow, you're going from a startup to this big company. Well, Amazon really tries to recreate that startup culture. In fact, we have something called the two pizza team. What's a two pizza team? Well, essentially it's a small startup inside of a big company. And in fact, I would say that Amazon is made up a bunch of small startups inside of a larger aggregate company. Um, a small startup or a two pizza team, you have true ownership. You truly go after your customers. You're autonomous. You can make your own decisions. And that is the culture that Amazon builds with these two pizza teams, ensuring that we're really replicating that scrappiness and that disruptor capability that a startup brings to the table. Now, Datacom, who is one of Asia PAC's leading local owned based service providers, leverages this two pizza team concept too. They've recently won our 2021 AWS Partner of the Year Award for best data led migration for consulting. Um, and what did they do? Well, with a two pizza team, they were able to build a data platform to enable them to store and analyze and act upon all different kinds of data. We all know that data has a lot of gravity and being able to have these teams to focus on real time internet of things and machine data is really powerful. So this concept I believe is so important in order to make you um, craft your culture so that it stands the test of time. Having a two pizza team is really important and any company can do this. It doesn't just have to be um, Amazon. I do think it's a secret of success being able to have teams that feel empowered, 
um, that feel like they have to go talk to the customer versus defaulting it to a marketing department or defaulting that view of customer to a, an analyst report or a focus group that happens somewhere else. Really and truly understanding who your customers are and why they are important. And then making sure those teams are small enough to be nimble and scrappy is a really important part of your culture. Now, another part of culture that I find really fascinating and one of the hardest for me, believe it or not, when I came into Amazon, is this concept called high velocity decision making. Our nickname for it is one-way door and two-way doors. Now, why is this so important? Well, there are different kinds of decisions that you make, and most companies only have one speed of making a decision. Um, I know I've worked for very big companies and every decision was consensus and slow. And then I've worked for startups where every decision was fast, even when we should have slowed down a little bit. And that's where Amazon really differentiates the types of decisions. For example, a two-way door decision is a, is a decision where you can make the decision. And if you were wrong, you can reverse it. Those decisions you want to move really rapidly on. And we believe about 80% of decisions that you'll make during a day are two-way door decisions. So it could be I don't know, changing the color of your website from blue to red. Well, if your customers don't like it, you can easily switch that back. No harm, no foul. But a one-way door decision, you really want to slow down. You want to get a lot of opinions and ideas. You want to debate things on it. Let's say an example might be changing uh, an API. Well, if you change an API and you made a mistake, reversing that decision is really difficult. And so you really want to be thoughtful about that. Now, the interesting thing about Amazon is because they have these two velocity decision-making styles, your day goes fast decision, fast decision, fast, slow down, fast decision, fast decision, slow down. And so that was one of the hardest things for me to learn and to really figure out and be right a lot on was, am I in a one-way door decision right now or am I in a two-way door decision right now? And which way do I want to, um, which way do I really want to lean on that decision? Now, one of the interesting decisions that we just made is um, for India, and this is me with a group of female entrepreneurs. Um, I was actually in Delhi and um, we were brainstorming about what's needed for the next generation. Well, one of the things that we, we're talking about was a machine learning summer camp where we could actually develop some of those great machine learning skills. And I'm really excited because Swami, our vice president in charge of machine learning, just announced and starting in India that we are going to have an Amazon machine learning summer camp. Um, and I think this is great. Now, is this a one-way door or two-way door? It's a two-way door, right? We can do the summer camp. And if it's really successful, we can just keep doing it. If we do the summer camp and it's not successful for whatever reason, maybe it was virtual, it should have been in person, we could tweak it, we could pivot, um, and we can change it. So it's definitely a two-way door decision, and one that I'm really excited about hosting this machine learning summer camp um, in India. So now let's go on to our third and final element. We talked about customer obsession. We talked about culture. Now let's talk a little bit about curiosity. Now, curiosity is really important because innovators ask a lot of questions. They're very curious. For example, preschoolers ask almost 100 questions a day, but we, as adults, only ask on average 10 questions a day. One of my friends who is a professor at Stanford wrote a book and did some research and found that great innovators like Jeff Bezos, Steve Jobs when he was alive, Ian Musk, they ask hundreds of questions a day. They're like that preschool child. They're asking questions, asking questions, asking questions, seeking to understand. And it is that natural curiosity that causes them to innovate at great rates. So for example, um, this is our Deep Racer. It's a race car, 1 18th the size of a real race car. It's got IoT sensors on it. Um, it helps you to learn machine learning reinforcement techniques. And uh, we created this in a deep racer league so that people could learn machine learning. 
Now, why was this so innovative? And what does this have to do with curiosity? Well, if you ask the first question, hey, what do you need? Well, we need more machine learning skills. Well, the obvious answer would be, let's do a machine learning summer camp. Let's do more classes. And that is really important. You just heard me talk about that. It's really important. But as you keep asking questions, well, will a summer camp, will a, um, a university class, will that be enough? No, there's so much need for data scientists and machine learning experts and those who know about IoT. So how do we get everybody interested in it? Well, what if we think about training in a different way? Great, let's create a race car. We'll have deep racer leagues. And in order to race them, you'll have to learn reinforcement learning. You'll have to learn some of the skills about how to collect data from IoT sensors that help you guide the race car around the track. If you're curious and you ask more and more questions, you come up with even more and more disruptive ideas. Now, diversity also drives that curiosity, right? Because if you've got a diverse team, you're going to ask not only more questions, but different kinds of questions. And that's why any study that you look at, this is just happens to be one for McKinsey, it shows that diverse teams really innovate faster. They're more likely to capture new market segments. They're more likely to go after and gain new market segment share. Why? Because they have a diversity of thought. Uh, one of our teams that we were working with, um, they weren't innovating very fast and we couldn't figure it out because if you looked at them, they had men, they had women, they were racially diverse, they were globally diverse. But one of the things we found out is they all graduated from the same school. They had the same methodology and they had been taught the same for four years. So you got to think about diversity in all kinds of ways. You're looking for that diversity of thought. We came out with a program called Think Big for Small Business to help reward that diversity of thought. In fact, um, any company who is a small company, diverse company, black, brown, women, men, veterans, you name it, can get some extra support because of that diversity. Because we know if we have more partners who are diverse, they represent more of our customer base and they're gonna help us ask bigger and better questions. So for example, in South Korea, we have a company called Cloud Prime. And the CEO here is amazing because he's asking different questions. He's delivering government funded projects to support other small and medium businesses. And because we've got this whole diverse network, we get better and better in serving our customers as well. That curiosity grows greater and greater. Here's another great example, Anina Nett. Believe it or not, she's based in China. Her company, 360 Fashion, and she was very curious about um, how to help people if they needed help, especially women. So she created this beautiful ring and it's got an IoT sensor in it so that if you tap it, you can actually call for help. It has a back end of AWS. Again, thinking differently because you've got people based in China, working with a different market, coming up with some great ideas that go across the globe. So I'm going to end where I began. Innovation is about empathy. How will you get to know your customers? How will you get to know the next trends or being able to see around the corners? I would argue that you need to obsess over your customers. You need to create that culture where innovation is part of the DNA. And you need to make sure that you're asking the questions, that you're curious, and that your entire ecosystem of partners and others are also curious and also helping you to ask those right, right questions. Now, why is this so important? Well, innovation is believed by CEOs around the world, 98% of them, to be the next competitive advantage. And today, 93% of those CEOs don't believe that they have the right teams in-house. So I wanted to share this with you so that you could show how innovative you are. And I do think that this is a very, um, a very important topic that needs to be addressed right away. So let me stop for a second and give you a riddle. I love this riddle. So it's a lily pond and the lily pond with lily pads double in size every day. So if one day 
there are, um, let's say three lily pads in the pond. On the next day, there are six because three times two is six. So here's a question. If on the 60th day, the pond is full, on what day is the pond only half colored? Okay, I know I can hear some of your answers coming in and some of you are right, it's day 59. Because if the pond is half full on day 59 and it doubles, that means on day 60, it's full. So why do I use this example? Well, I believe that innovation is so important and innovation and disruption are happening faster and faster and faster. So I don't want you looking out there at your lily pond and saying, oh, it's only half full, I have time. Make sure you take some of the lessons from today and apply them right away. I don't want you tomorrow to go, oh my gosh, the pond is already full. So take this time. Don't overanalyze what you need to do. Pick out one or two of these things that you think could apply to your company and to you and just get going. Don't overanalyze it. Just get going. I would love to hear your comments on this presentation as well. I've included my Twitter handle, Sandy underscore Carter. You can also reach me on LinkedIn or practically any social media network. I want to thank you again for having me on Digital Asia Summit. Thank you to the organizers who did such a great job. And thank you for being such an amazing audience. Thank you.